Join us as our guest on the Baseball Happenings podcast is Rob Petrazzo, co-founder of Rally. And he's here to discuss with us today their partnership with Tops to produce uh, limited first edition sets of its 20. 20- 20 complete set of the flagship product that's going to only be available to rallies investors rob thanks for joining us today no likewise thank you for having me appreciate it sure so you know that was a kind of a mouthful there about what you're doing with tops before we get into what you're going to be doing with tops why don't you explain to the listeners um about what rallies platform is and what you're offering with the platform yeah, sure. So Rally, in a nutshell, is the, uh, the first ever liquid platform for investing in collectibles. So what we do is we take things like baseball cars and vintage literature and classic cars, all these assets that have strong history of appreciation, a lot of attention, and in most cases, a lot of nostalgia, and we turn those into stock offerings on our platform. So everything goes through qualification with the SEC and becomes sort of a stock similar to the way that you would trade you know, an Apple or, uh, or a Tesla on a regular stock exchange. The difference is it goes through a rally, all through registered broker dealers. And these are these assets that a lot of times have great history. They have a lot of sort of momentum in the space. And we try and bring the best quality versions, a lot of the blue chip stuff, some of the stuff that, you know, prices have gotten a little bit crazy for the average collector. But to make sure there's always possibility to access something really unique at that high price point without spending a ton of money. So all shares on our platform start at around $10, $20 a share, uh, in some cases, $1 per share. So really, the the idea is access for everyone to these really high-end collectibles. And baseball and basketball cards have been a huge draw for us in the the recent times, obviously, with the way the space has gone. But that's a lot of what our roadmap for the next year looks like as well. Now, you know, for our listeners, maybe the easier, like, understand. So, for example, if you had a high-grade 52 tops mantle, um, this would be a way for people to buy pieces of that mantle because they might not have, you know, the few hundred thousand dollars to buy a high grade mantle. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And that's funny you mentioned that because that was actually the first offering that we did in the sports space was the 52 mantle uh, PSA eight, which we did uh, at around one hundred and thirty thousand dollars, which is now trading up on the platform around six or seven percent. Uh, over the course of the last few months, but that's a perfect example. It's also something that, you know, a lot of collectors are putting collections together and they might have, you know, a 56 mantle, or they might have something that's a little more recent that's in the same vein or has the same DNA. To be able to put full collections together of every year or every season and do that in a place where you're not kind of priced out from the earlier stuff or rookies, that's kind of a big sort of uh, momentum grab for us and something that we focus on as well. Mm. Uh, Interesting. And so, you know, today we're really talking more about your collaboration with Tops with this production of these limited first edition um, sets of the, you know, 2020 flagship product. How did the partnership come to be between you and Tops? So when I won't speak on behalf of Tops, I'll speak on behalf of Rally as best I can. But that's sort of a name that for me has always evoked a lot of nostalgia. I think mm-hmm. the... Um, one of the reasons that this company was created actually was because of a Topps 1990 Frank Thomas card. And that was something that me as a 37 year old now, uh, when I was growing up, this was sort of the coming of age at 1990, 1991. It was always about collecting and being with your friends. And that was the first card that kind of hit my radar as something that I wanted to have. I wanted to get a bunch of them. Anytime I could find sort of like a, a 1990s box, I would try and sort of get friends together and buy the whole box. That was always something that we focused on when I was younger. And now in retrospect, I lost all those cards when I was younger. I, I, kept them, I lost so many of them. And that's not a card that's, you know, blowing through the auction results, but it's something that is very valuable now. So it's valuable from a nostalgia standpoint for me, but also from a price standpoint as well. So we thought about, you know, the first producer that we want to work with. The, this is the first time that Rally's worked directly with the manufacturer. We want to go after the, the, the top and that, you know, no pun intended. We want to go after the people that really understand this space that have been through a bunch of different cycles inside the space, really, you know, understand it as an art form, as a collection, but also as an investment too. And you see that they've really invested in the younger demographic with 2020 Project and some of the new initiatives that they have. It felt like a natural marriage for us in terms of the user base that we have, which is very much, you know, the 30 year olds who really kind of collected when they were younger and maybe missed the boat a little bit. Mm-hmm. But in terms of sort of the producer that has that trust stamp and has done it at a really high level for a long time and has access to the best stuff. So we thought MLB, you think tops automatically. For us, it's been a huge space. We've been talking to them over the course of the last, you know, 
few months at a high level about what we do, what they're going into, everything from the candy side of tops all the way to sort of the cards and the collectibles. And this was really when we started thinking about what we wanted to do on the platform. We wanted something unique that was immediately recognizable, and Tops was a no-brainer for us. You mentioned the word cycles, right? As someone who's also in that age range, you know, I've seen the sports card cycles. You know, we hit the strike, things went back down. Then, you know, there was the glutton of manufacturers. Then it things everything's kind of condensed, and now Tops kind of has, you know, the stronghold being that they have the exclusive uh, license with the uh, union. Um, and so, you know, we've seen the investment cycle also turn over where, you know, at some point cards were being sold as investment and then, you know, the rug kind of got pulled back under from it. And now here we are again talking about cards as an investment. While we can't predict the future, um, what can you speak to in terms of, you know, hey, the collector that might be a little weary of like, hmm, this smells a lot like 1993, 94 again. <laughs> well, I, I would hope that there's no baseball strike to prevent anything happening like 94, 95. But I think right. that the way that we see the cycles working is that, you know, much like the equity markets and much like any investment, the best quality is always kind of what gets the attention. And whether that means that prices go up or prices stabilize or they go down but pop again, we always try and focus on that top quality. And whether that's top quality producers or top quality cards, we do feel like the the external factors are a little bit out of our control and they always will be. So when you think about, you know, 93, 94, and then like, you know, the equivalent of a five year hangover for Major League Baseball where it, it loses a little bit of a luster, but then all of a sudden you get the, you know, the McGuire and the Sosa that bring it back yes. a little bit worse. And then you think about now where you have so many young kids and you think about like what was 2011 through 2014, I'll say. And that's mm -hmm. in New York, it's like DeGrom was the be all end all and kind of still is to a degree. And then you have Mike Trout who changes the game forever, obviously, and is the next coming of Babe Ruth. And you have a young <laughs> kid who has that same feel as I did watching, you know, Mark McGuire when I was younger. It's the same situation. So we try and, as best we can, find best quality examples. We let the cycles play themselves out. But with baseball, like with many sports, it's very much you know star-driven. And every five or six years, regardless of what happened before that, you get that star who really shines through. And whether that's regionally or you know globally, like like a trout, it's something that drives the entire industry around it. So we always try and stay ahead of that game, but we don't let those cycles dictate what we what we acquire or what goes on the platform. We just want best version, best in class. Right, somebody who has best that. of breed, right. Yeah. So now I'm looking at the release. Um, and so each card in the set is going to be stamped with uh, the first edition foil. And they'll only have 12 copies um, in existence. So does this mean every single one of the 700 cards are being printed in a quantity of 12 for your yes. platform? Yeah. And that's only so that's that's, you know, only 12 each card in the set exists, period. But Rally will let hundreds of collectors own a piece of these cards at a really affordable price point. Right. So they, so people will have actually an opportunity to invest in every single card individually in the set. Yeah. So you're investing in the entire set um, and you're sort of getting access at a share price that's very approachable, mm -hmm. of which, you know, 10 to give the sort of specifics, 12 total, 10 are for us. Tops is holding on to two. So 10 factory cases all yes. Sort of offering on the platform. You invest in, you know, one share. You buy a share of all of it. Got it. Okay. So that's a lot clearer for you know the people who are going to be reading and listening to this is that when they buy a share, they're buying one share, and that like uh, each share, and that's going to represent part of that. Those you're getting a piece of all ten of those sets. Is this this is what you're saying? Correct. And that's ten dollars a share, ten thousand shares, a one hundred thousand dollar offering. You're buying a share in the whole bundle. Okay. And that's kind of like part of the way that we sort of thought about this company. And again, going back to that that first sort of the Frank Thomas card and, and my history and the history of myself, my co-founders, that was always a thing for us. It was like, if you can get a set, you can get your hands on a box and we all throw in and kind of do it together. Mm. That was like a big idea when I was younger. And it was always like saving the allowance money or, or like literally going door to door with newspaper type stuff. You know, you have a hundred bucks and you get this like, what would the equivalent now is like a throwaway set, but it was awesome to have. We yeah. want to sort of make that same feel and do it in a way that was a true investment and that was being treated sort of as museum quality investment where it's always maintained. It goes through the SEC in a way that's always transparent. And you're getting you're getting that one share even with $10 access to all of it. And it's only available in this one place. 
And so now, you know, the shares are going to live digitally that people are buying, but there are, as you said, 10 physical sets in your possession, correct? Correct. And then so over time, what is going to happen to the sets? Because this is the interesting part of what I was trying to wrap my head around is like these cards exist. People are buying shares in them. But, um, you know, long term, what is going to happen with the sets? Do you have the option at some point of dissolving uh, you know, the sets or how is that going to work? Cause I'm still trying to wrap my head around to like, you're going to buy a share, you're going to get a piece, but these cards still do exist. What's going to drive the long-term demand. If, if someone can't like, uh, you know, somewhat artificially manipulated. And what I mean by that is like, you know, there's only a certain amount of graded mantles on the market. Well, as long as they exist, uh, reside in people's personal collections and they're not out there, right. You've reduced what's like on the market. How is that going to work with, what you all have in hand yeah so that's a good question we do a few things so for first and foremost the everything on our platform is always for sale and we sort of uh we don't solicit but we always ex we always have offers coming in non-stop for assets on the platform mm -hmm. that's part of building out you know this fantastic collection with the idea that you know best in breed best in class the ex very exclusive can only get it here only exists on rally so if someone wants to sort of put that collection together and they have to start from scratch, they have to come to rally first. So we'll always field those offers. We have stuff that sells off platform pretty actively. Um, the most recent of which obviously with the, the Jordan craze, the, the Jordan rookie that we had, the PSA 10 Jordan rookie that we had, it went live platform for uh, $40,000. And this is obviously pre last dance. And then, you know, 14 days later, the entire world of collecting changes and that card, you know, doubles nearly two, two, two point five X's in value. And we had a lot of offers come in. One was qualified. We go to our investors. We poll them and make sure that their survey is collected. Uh, if the majority say yes, we want to sell at that price. It goes to our third-party advisory board. If the okay is made and the funds are available, everything clears. Everyone gets paid out. Okay. The other side of that, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was, I was thinking about that. Now that makes more sense. So let's say, you know, whatever, the car goes up, like you said, two, three, four X, and they're, the, the investor is going to get that return on – um, their initial investment, but they'll have been cashed out. Yeah, and then we also have, so we maintain a, a marketplace where through bridge to broker dealers, there's a, a trading market where it goes by true bid ask. And again, over the course of the next, you know, three or four months after the, uh, the initial offering closes, it'll be in this mini lockup period after all those initial shares are sold. Mm -hmm. Once trading opens, who's to say what happens with those, with the cars inside of that case, with the rookies that are involved, with some of the players that are, that are you know on a little bit of a tear right now, three four months from now, if you know the league is getting the attention that it probably could and probably should, and there's a few breakout stars which can only exist inside this case, we let the market dictate what the price should be of that entire set, and that'll happen probably in three and a half four months, which happens usually after the lockup period uh, of the initial offering, which will go live next week. And then so what happens to the two sets that Tops have? Because that seems like an interesting wild card in this too now I, I don't know if you're like qualified to speak on it because like tops might have rights over it but um you know what can you tell us about those two sets that tops have because to me i'm like all right well that's you know one sixth of the total population of these cards that they have yeah so can't speak to it specifically but i can say that you know they have incredible archives and they've been really diligent about making sure that the sort of best and breed type stuff stays you know close to the best in some cases they look at them sort of as a mix of i think at least the way i see it as a mix of something great that everyone can enjoy. But I think that, you know, having a piece of that to stay at home is important to them as a brand, as it should be, as it is for us as well. So we'll do, we'll, we'll be working with sort of, um, you know, as the first iteration of us working with a big brand like Tops. We'll, we'll hope stay in that, in that relationship with Tops and we'll do some more events at some of our physical locations when, uh, when we, when we sort of everything opens back up here in New York and our store here in Soho, which will be reopened at some point, hopefully in the fall. And there's always a chance that that becomes something that comes to our platform as well. We don't know where it goes from here, but we know that, you know, of the 12 that exists, two will stay with tops, 10 will be with the investors. And, you know, maybe at some point that whole family gets back together of uh, 12, 12 sets. We don't know. We'll see what right. happens. That's interesting. I can imagine somebody with a really, uh, you know, big checkbook, you know, mm -hmm. wanting to be like, this is mine. Right. And, and that could really <laughs> yeah, be an man. interesting story in the hobby. Now, what do you have to say for the people that maybe, skeptical like i said you know i'm like okay i feel like i've seen this repeat not with what you're doing because this is like new and unique but about the way the card market has been really you know trading the last six months to a year um like i said this this reminds me of like 
uh, quote unquote, you know, bubble in the sports card market. What do you have to say to people that are like, oh, this is something that's artificially created. There's a artificial demand. And at the end of the day, how much different are these than, you know, your flagship set that you can go, you know, buy at retail? Yeah. So, I mean, it's an understandable question. Skeptics will always exist. And so what is for its worth, we understand. I think that the way I look at it is that anybody who's using a new financial platform, you should be skeptical. You should ask questions. And if the company you're working with isn't transparent about what they're doing, maybe it is something you move to the next one. But what's happened in this space is is obviously there's been some dramatic moves. It's a very unique time for, for sports cars and collectibles in general across the board. I think that what we try and do is make sure that all of our investors, <clears throat> sorry, all of our potential customers, everybody who comes in this community is as educated as possible on what these all mean and what it actually is. And part of the process for us is that, you know, we see tens of thousands of potential assets that go on our platform every year. We wind up doing anywhere between, you know, 60 and 150 initial offerings. And that's something that we take very, very seriously when it comes to the provenance, when it comes to sort of the relationship in cases like this, when it comes to what we put on the platform. We want to make sure everything we do has longevity. So, you know, I can't speak to what's happening everywhere in the space. I can say that at face value, when you look at, you know, eBay prices and you see what's happening in other places, there probably are some things that have just gone crazy because there's a lot of new liquidity in the market. Mm -hmm. But we do feel like stuff like this, where it's created in a very one of one way, where it's, you know, provenance is, is maintained and it's sort of, you know, something that's stamped with an approval. When it's something that really has staying power, we feel like over time, as you talked about in the beginning of this conversation, Cycles matter to pop culture. They they matter in small moments, mm -hmm. in cases like this, during an initial offering. But long term, the best stuff will always rise to the top. There's always a place for someone to sort of own the actual physical item, and we always we always we're huge proponents of that. And for me, that's important. But there's also stuff where you know if you want access to something that might be a little out of price range, and you want to have that exposure, we want to make that option possible without breaking the bank. And that's why this we feel like this is a really important part of this culture, and hopefully continues to build in terms of the way collectors see it. Yeah, you know, you talked earlier about the the price point, uh, you know, being very affordable for people getting on a product that, right, they otherwise would not um, be able to. Um, the way that you're seeing things move on your end, short term, you know, long term, what are you seeing in terms of like how prices are moving, even just on your platform, you know, off the top of your head of like this stuff is short term, but like we and I'm not talking about what you're doing. I mean, like right product x is kind of like done real well in the short term but we're not sure about the long term but these have kind of been the long term tried and true uh in this space what are you seeing either you know historically or that's emerging that's starting to become more of a long-term play yeah i think uh what we've seen at least and this is something that's not new it's it's pretty gonna become pretty apparent to everybody is that you know, the modern cards and current players who still have, you know, a long time to build their legacy or, or even if it's a short time in, in a LeBron case, for example, but potentially, potentially add a lot more value to their name over the course of the next two or three or four years. That's what's getting a lot of attention. That's the Trouts of the world, it's the LeBrons. Mm -hmm. But we're also seeing that some of the stuff that probably had fallen out of favor at a certain point, and the 52 Mantle is a good example, and that that's never really been, you know, down since 1953, basically. But it's also something that, it didn't sell well. It was something that, you know, you look at the history of that card and how many live in the Atlantic Ocean, yes. how many you know, thrown away. And it's the story that goes along with legends. We look at it as the equity markets, the, the average IPO of a real company, of anything you see on the NASDAQ or the Dow. It has a lifespan of around 13, 12 years. That's kind of like the average right now. Mm -hmm. When you look at like the 52 Mantle and you start thinking about something with 70 years of history, and you know a lot of stories along the way that contribute to that value and to what collectors see as blue chip. That's something where we want to be. We feel like that'll always be a situation where it rises to the top. Whether it's you know not necessarily the parabolic price appreciation that you see from you know like a Trout Refractor or from a LeBron rookie, mm -hmm. but at the same time it's something that you can get behind the story, you can get behind the player, and you can see a real track record of returns. We feel like the rotation back into that type of stuff is becoming more prevalent as the prices for the modern cards get more and more out of control. Even though the people that are kind of into those cards are starting to, you know, age up, you're seeing like a second wave from, you know, your 30, 40, 50 year olds that didn't grow up on Mantle per se. Yeah, we're seeing that. I think that information is so available now. And that really wasn't until 10 or 15 years ago. You think about like, you know, I'm older than Google. It's crazy to think about it like that. The ability to understand these stories 
is still relatively new. So to know who Honus Wagner was is not something that I expect a 10 or an 11 year old to know right now. But if they're getting into this hobby based on, you know, anything from like a, uh, from, from a, a Trout to even like a Derek Jeter and you're going back a few years, somebody especially in New York who holds a lot of relevance. Right. If you're getting into this hobby right now, that 11 year old, by the time they're 14 or 15, they're so immersed in information, they'll know who Honus Wagner is, they'll know what a T206 card is, and they'll be able to sort of think about things more in terms of a collectible and not say, ah, oh, this is stuff that like my, my grandfather would have cared about. They care about it in a way that I think wasn't really available to us when we were younger because you had to sort of be in the conversations, know what was going on. Sure. Now that information is so accessible and the education has become accessible as well. So we're seeing a lot of respect for that older stuff too. Yeah, and it's, it's, and it's different than like the short-term flipping culture as well. Um, yeah. Rob, um, where can they find out more information? You know, I, I see the website here is rallyrd.com, but – uh, you know, a lot of people are connected more than just websites. Where else can they catch up with what you're doing past the website uh, via yeah, you know, social so, media? Absolutely. Our Instagram is rally, at rally, R-A-L-L-Y. Um, on Twitter, we're on rallyrd. Uh, but everything's on rallyrd.com as well. We have links to all of our social. And as soon as we sort of reopen New York, we'll be reopening our showroom on uh, 250 Lafayette between Prince and Spring and Soho, which has some of these really – Amazing collectibles. We do a lot of events. We're hoping to have everybody out in the fall. Yeah, wonderful. I look forward to getting, uh, you know, getting down there once things, you know, things cleared off. I've kind of steered clear of Manhattan right now, uh, you know, as best, you know, yeah, as best I can. That, man. Completely understandable. But we're really looking forward to sort of, you know, everything being back to some sense of normalcy and really putting these assets on display for everybody to get a feel for it and understand these stories. Well, definitely wonderful. Well, you know, we really appreciate, you know, your time this afternoon. We're excited to see what happens uh, when it when it drops. And this is, uh, you know, an intriguing development uh, in this space. And, um, you know, it'll be a, a fun ride to see where things go. Yeah, man.